This is Star Talk. Neil deGrasse Tyson here, your personal astrophysicist. Got Chuck Nice with me. Chuck, how you doing, hey, man? Hey, what's up, Neil? Okay, professional comedian and actor. Yep, acting and... like a comedian. Acting like a comedian. <laughs> How's that working for you? Yeah, no. well, you know, it's it's nice work if you can get it. <laughs> <laughs> so today, what a topic today. Long overdue. Right. It's our electrified future. Yes. Mm. It's on. It's everybody's thinking about it. It's always in the headlines. Yeah. What direct? What path are we going to take as civilization mm. in order to protect or to survive? Very, to, to survive. To yeah, survive. Basically, in, let's be honest. We're 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 on the path to doom right now if we don't change. And yeah, well, you know. I we'll we'll be here after climate change, but civilization won't. That's right. the difference. Exactly. <laughs> Everything yeah. we've built yeah. that we call civilization, yeah. it's not clear how that will survive. And it'd be so, everybody what, who what survives we, and Kevin Costner. <laughs> what, it, oh, in, what in, a world. What a world. What a world. Okay, yeah. nobody saw that movie. So that no, I that's don't know true. Who, it's who a, it's a it's there. an obscure reference, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so, Chuck, I carry some knowledge in this field, but mm-hmm. for this kind of topic, we need expertise, like centerline expertise. So we comb the landscape. We found a PhD chemical engineer named David Reichmuth. David, welcome to Star Talk. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Very excellent. You got a PhD in chemical engineering specializing in electric vehicles this is a thing wow. and you're a senior engineer in the clean transportation program of the union of concerned scientists i remember these folks from way back deep cold war era so tell me what who they are and what you all are doing today and presumably you're still worrying about nukes mm. yeah no i mean that was the genesis about 50 years ago in, in cambridge massachusetts some um, mit scientists concerned about the militarization of, of science Um, especially around uh, nuclear weapons. And, um, you know, and since that time, you know, we're looking at how do we bring the voice of science into into policy, um, not just in terms of of weapons, but now in terms of climate change and and the environment as well. Yeah. You got a lot to be concerned about there, David. (laughs) <laughs> That's right. You got, a, you, got a lot of, you got a lot on your mind there. You got a lot on your mind. <laughs> but these are very concerned people. Very, this is this very is right. concerned. It's, it's, yeah. it's what, a what, bunch no, of guys I, in lab coats sitting around stroking their chins. Like oh. right, right. No, Chuck. I can oh. see uh, the, the, the crossover point. Will they become when they become the union of pissed off scientists? <laughs> <laughs> That's what we need. <laughs> That is what we need. We need the union of pissed off scientists. I love it. <laughs> I, I think we're already there. But, yeah. But, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. There you go. There you go. <laughs> but we already got the website, so we'll, we'll keep the name for now. <laughs> so you focus on energy analysis, yeah. transportation sustainability, both of things we need maximally Desperately. in our modern civilization. And, of course, they overlap. And zero emission vehicles. Nice. So – so, which, which true but, zero but, emission, you, you you can't start with the vehicle, light, right? True, true zero emission, we got to start with the grid. Or, or yeah, just no. what, where the energy is coming from, right? right? I mean, that's that's okay. But let's back, let's back up for a minute. You specialize yeah. in transportation. What fraction of our carbon footprint as civilization comes from transportation at this point? Ooh, good one. Yeah. So if you, if you look at the U.S., um, you've got man-made sources of um, climate pollution. Uh, transportation is the largest single sector. Um, it, it's over a quarter of all human caused emissions in the wow. US. Wow. And um, when you look at transportation, over half that comes from passenger cars and trucks. Look so passenger cars and trucks alone are um, more emissions than, than residential and commercial buildings put together. Um, and, and what about you know, the, when you say trucks, you mean even even trucks for distribution of goods? We're talking about uh, the, the pickup trucks and SUVs in, in, in our driveways. Not uh, um, So when we talk about the half the emissions of transportation coming from passenger cars and trucks, we're just talking about um, regular old pickup trucks, what we're not, driving, not delivery just, trucks. Yeah, yeah, everyday person driving around is half of all emissions. That's, yeah. that's insane. That's Half of all transportation emissions. Uh, half and, of all yeah. transportation emissions, yeah. And the other half comes from what form of transportation? Well, that, that's that's sort of your your, lar- your larger trucks, and then um, 
plane, um, shipping, uh, rail, um, but but really, um, it's most of that that is going to be your your larger trucks right. as well. So it's it's the okay, on road so transportation is really the the, the bulk of, of emissions. As the senior uh, member of the three of us, the old fart, uh, <laughs> I, I I I have deeper memories than you guys. I remember when air pollution simply meant the air was dirty. <laughs> so now, the, now the air is pretty clean, all things considered, clean in terms of transparency. But we now think of CO2, the right. byproduct of, of combustion, burning fossil fuels, as a pollutant of sorts. Uh, is that fair to say? And, 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 and do we add that to what is still a, a polluting forces in our environment, such as the burning of coal? Yeah. So, I mean, you can look at it in terms of climate pollution and look, I mean, there's because it's such a huge part of our emissions, there's no way to like reduce our climate changing emissions without doing something about passenger cars and trucks. Absolutely. I mean, there's also the air pollution that comes from these vehicles and they are cleaner than, than the vehicles of, uh, of, of 30 years ago. Of my childhood. Yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but there's still, you know, there's still, um, you know, air pollution that is, yeah causing um you know health impacts um yeah. from the, these vehicles so um you know, a lot of it is is coming from this uh fine particulate matter um and so you want to and it's particles that are it's pm 2.5 is a technical term it's particles that are smaller than 2.5 microns or micrometers so a micron that, is a millionth of a meter if i remember yes. correctly is that correct okay yeah yeah, and just sort of context, like so. If you have hair, uh, it's about uh, seventy. If you have uh, hair, <laughs> <laughs> seventy microns. I, is hypo, I, yeah. Hypothetically, if, <laughs> if one had hair on their head, right. yes. they could pull it out. Okay, I, I yes. don't take that for granted, but yes. <laughs> um, so that's about seventy uh, microns is the average human hair, and and the, so we're talking about particles that are two point five and smaller. So really, really tiny particles, um, mm -hmm. and these particles are coming from the exhaust but in most cases they're not coming directly it's it's actually nitrogen oxides volatile organic gases combining the atmosphere making combining with sunlight making two, these very really tiny particles and then those particles are going deep into your lungs and that's coming because from of how small they are yeah so they, they can yeah. they go past you know all, all of the filtering that you have naturally in your nose and in your uh, and even in the top of your lungs and that get deep into your lungs they can even cross into the bloodstream these are really um you know that's where the most health impacts from air pollution is coming from these tiny particles Whoa. and it's not when you say air pollution from vehicles everyone thinks oh like a, a big rig like or a bus belching you know a black cloud or uh you know a, an old car that's that's burning oil but even a new car that doesn't look like it's putting out this pollution it is leading to these really tiny particles that that lead to asthma, yeah. asthma heart attacks. Yeah. Oh, so yeah. and, and, and the rate is the latest research that I read, because I read a lot about pollution for climate change mostly, but still, is that the previous thinking was that it it triggered asthma, but now the thinking is that. Uh, traffic pollution is causing asthma, particularly for what you just said about the tiniest part of your bronchioles. Uh, uh, I forget the name of it, alveoli or something like that. Um, that's where these particulates end up lodging. And uh, so it, it, it actually causes asthma. Yeah, and it's it's not just asthma. I mean, asthma is the most you know, like most when common. you think about bre breathing in particles yeah. to your lungs. You think asthma, and you think you know, sort of lung disease. But it's it's also cardiovascular disease. It's low birth weight. Um, wow. It's it's a lot of different um, impacts beyond just asthma. But um, you know, this is these are, this is pollution that that shortens people's lives. Yeah. So, yeah. David, civilization is killing us. That's what you're saying. Which <laughs> no, he's I'm concerned. saying that. Uh, <laughs> I love that he went, no, I'm not saying that at all. <laughs> no. I, I'm what? saying we, 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 we ha we're exposed to this pollution, some of us um, more than others. Uh, and, yes. um, and, and we can get into that if you want. But, um, but we have now these options to, to reduce that 
And so yeah. that's where Okay, I'm so like, one of the options we've been told is switch over to an electric car. Yay! Electric cars have zero emissions at the car. At the car. Okay, I get that. I, all right, but they had to build the car. The car has weird ingredients in it that regular car, quote, you know, the ICE cars, uh, internal combustion engine cars don't have. And that electricity is coming from somewhere. And I don't think it's all from solar panels yet. So tell me about how green a green car really is. Yeah. So, I mean, that is something that I've spent a lot of time doing analysis around. And so, you know, first so you're you the right at, guy for this question. Yeah, I, okay, I'm I, I, okay. I am the right guy. Uh, so mm-hmm. first, let's look about like what you talked about the tailpipe pollution and that. Yeah. So a fully electric vehicle, obviously, no tailpipe, no tailpipe emissions. That's that's an easy one. And, and but because you, know, you said, hey, that's maybe not the whole story. That means that it's a it's a zero emission vehicle, maybe at the car tailpipe, but not. Um, overall. And so what we need to do then is we look at the life cycle analysis. So we need to do an apples to apples comparison of the looking at the whole process of getting that car recharged and compare it to refueling a gasoline car, because that's what we're trying to see if it's better than, right? Right. That's the current technology. And so that means for an electric car going upstream and looking at, okay, what are the emissions from power plants? Um, And then beyond that, like, if it's a coal power plant, a natural gas power plant, um, what are the emissions from getting that coal out of the ground or getting that methane out of the ground and getting it to um, the power plant? And so you have to add up all those emissions and then compare them to the same thing for a gasoline car. Obviously, you're burning gasoline in the car. So we have those emissions that are coming out of the tailpipe of CO2. But you also have all the emissions of getting crude oil out of the ground right? Um, and then getting it to a refinery, turning it into gasoline, getting that gasoline, um, you know, to a refueling station. And so there's all those steps as well. If you do that, you find that electric vehicles have, you know, not zero total emissions, but they have much lower emissions than, than a gasoline vehicle. So if you look at where EVs have been sold in the U S um, they have on average, the average EV has emissions about equal to an 88 mile per gallon gasoline car. If oh, that exists. that's amazing. So it's, it's, yeah. And that's, that's based on the average EV. If you know, and it does depend on where in the country you are. Some places are going to be cleaner than others. Right. Um, if you look in the average EV in like the Northeast part of the U S it's equal to about 110 miles per gallon emissions uh, gasoline car emissions right. interesting uh, to think about it in that metric because that would tell the auto manufacturers keep using gas but make me a hundred mile mile per gallon car and then it's it then you're you're you're, you're right neck and neck out. with you're, the electric you're, car you've achieved out. equilibrium yeah the the only problem is you can't do that there's like physics um, I mean, like, like, uh, oh, that, pes- just, that pesky uh, thing, that old pesky uh, thing, physics. God, what does physics have to do with it? Well, Come again, on, David. Physics. Yeah, there's the maximum thermodynamic efficiency of a of a combustion engine, and, and it's pretty you, low. You know, it's very low. Mm. I mean, you, you, we're we're getting, yeah, you know, we're pretty close to, you know, you can get a, um, you, know, you can get a, a gasoline car that gets up into the fifties mile per gallon range right with with some of the mm-hmm. the, the non-plug-in hybrids but you can't really get further than that without doing you know a significant size change in the vehicle or, or you know um or I've, I've got a fast so- story which is a little bit of an off-ramp so uh we've had steam engines like forever right so why did it take until 1903 to make an airplane which is just another engine but now it's flying and the problem was to get enough power out of a steam engine required a steam engine that was so heavy, you could never get enough power to fly the damn thing. Okay. And so all the experiments people were doing would say, oh, that'll never work. That'll never work. It was not until we had the internal combustion engine that, that the Wright brothers then put that in the airplane. And now you, it's much lighter compared with the power output. Uh, and then you, then you had airplanes. There it was. So it's physics. The physics you can't you can't make a light enough steam engine to do this with. Are, are you saying that the the moment that we go fully electric, we're gonna have flying cars? 
Did I, I didn't think I said that. Did I, did I, David, I, do you didn't hear me say that, did you? I, I don't think so. <laughs> Introducing the all-electric Ford Mustang Mach-E SUV. Ford is electrifying its icons to keep the soul of driving alive while shifting towards an electric vehicle future. The Mustang Mach-E is an SUV with the bold style of a Mustang, which means you can make a bold statement and still be practical. The 2023 Mustang Mach-E GT Performance Edition SUV achieves zero to 60 miles per hour in 3.5 seconds. It's an EV with exhilarating torque and available features like electric all-wheel drive and a drive mode called Unbridled. It has room for you, your people, and your things with five seats and a frunk, otherwise known as a front trunk. Experience the freedom and thrill of the drive while knowing your needs can still be met. Learn more about the all-electric Ford Mustang Mach-E SUV at Ford.com slash SUVs slash Mach hyphen E. Due to high demand and global supply chain constraints, some models, trims, and features may not be available or may be subject to change. Check with your local dealer for current information. For the zero to 60 miles per hour in 3.5 seconds, Ford test data is based on a typical industry methodology using one foot rollout. Your results may vary. Uh, so, okay, so that's a fascinating way to compare that. Now, what about, uh, you haven't mentioned access to the rare uh, metals or other components of not only the battery, but also the the significant computing load that uh, an electric car carries. Yeah, so we also looked at sort of what are the emissions from from building an electric vehicle? Because as you said, like the, there are the emissions involved in making that battery. And so when you look at manufacturing a gasoline vehicle, manufacturing a electric vehicle, the uh, emissions for building that electric vehicle for, for global warming emissions are higher. And um, so there, there's sort of this this... Um, emissions deficit, but you pay off that debt over the in life about, of yeah, in about, uh, it depends on whether you're looking at a pickup truck or, or a car and depending on where you are, but on average for a pickup truck in about a year and a half of driving and about two years of driving for, for a car. Well, wow. um, and so overall, if you take in both the driving and the manufacturer of the vehicle, if you compare an electric pickup truck to a, to, um, a gasoline pickup truck, it's it's less than half the total um, global warming emissions, even when you consider the manufacturing of the battery. So okay, so uh, now what? So now that's assuming that the electric grid is being fed by traditional coal or or uh, or gas. Right. So if you can have an electrical grid that is green, either oh. from tidal or oh. wind or solar. And because I, I tell you, I had this moment some years ago, 20 years ago, I was driving an electric car, test driving an electric car, and I did it at a power station. And one of the, the I was going to call it spigots, but no, but one of the, the, the stanchions at the power station connected to their nuclear plant. And so we charged up this car from the nuclear plant and I drove it around and I, I felt so zero carbon footprint in that moment I, it was it was, yeah. it was a it was a remarkable feeling in that moment i said wow I, not a single charcoal briquette was harmed in this. <laughs> not a single gallon of gasoline was used to, to make this happen yeah i mean that's a great point because um you know all the analysis i've done is based on sort of historical data so the most recent data i could get from the epa is from um 2021 so we're, we're kind of looking back now a couple of years uh, when we do this analysis. And, um, you know, that grid is getting cleaner over time. At Union Concerned Scientists, we've been doing this analysis now for, for over 10 years. When we first did this analysis, it, the, the results were a little more mixed, you know, because we had almost half the power in, you know, in 2009, almost half the power in the U.S. coming from coal. That's now down below 20%. Right. Uh, a, a power coming from coal, um, you know, renew, uh, renewables are now higher um, than than coal in the U.S. So we're making this transition, and those cars are getting cleaned up. And the cool thing about electric cars is that 
um, you know, you if you buy a car you know, five years ago and the grid gets cleaner, that means the emissions are going down over time for that. Oh, even, right, for your car. Your, yeah, for your car. So it's not just like, you know, if right. you want to get a gasoline car that's more efficient, that has fewer emissions, you have to go out and get a new car that's, you know, has a higher MPG. Your electric car is right. going to be plugging into the same plug, but it's going to be getting cleaner as we clean up the as grid. Even up those old EVs are getting cleaner. That's amazing. Yeah. So there's a book I read called Turning Oil into Salt. And I forgot the, the two authors, co-authors of that, where that, that made a fascinating point, which was you have a car that requires oil products, so gasoline, it'll only run on gasoline. So wherever your oil comes from in the world, you know about it because it's str- it's a strategic commodity. Salt used to be a strategic commodity because it was the only way you could preserve foods from one harvest into the next spring. And so your life depended on knowing where the salt come from and how much it cost. Today, do you know how much your salt costs? Do you even care? Do you know where it comes from? You don't know and you don't care because we have 12 other ways to preserve your food. Refrigeration, freezing, canning. Um, it goes on and on. And salt is like a, a one of a dozen or more. So the thesis of the book was, if you have a car that does not depend on gasoline, that could run on 30 different types of fuel, then the gasoline is no longer a strategic commodity. It just mm. has to compete with 30 other commodities. Well, how big an engine do you have to have so that you can put anything in it and have it still run? Oh, no, just make an electric car, plug it into the wall, and on the other oh, side of that God, plug yeah. oh, there wow. is the sources, the multiple sources of energy that are competing with each other. There's an open marketplace, uh, our demands, what they supply. And so, so an electric car does run on 25 different sources of fuel. Is that a fair uh, understanding of this, David? Yeah, I mean, that is one of the huge advantages that you can make electricity from cleaner sources and we can make that transition. And it doesn't mean, you know, your electric vehicle still plugs into the same outlet. The two authors there, I've got Anne Corn and Gail Luft. So uh, they're the two authors of that yeah. of that book, Turning Oil into Salt. I thought it was a brilliant thesis there. Yeah. Yeah, so, so David, so David, are you at odds with oil companies here? Uh, why don't they just convert to green or is that what they're already doing? Oh. They're, they're they at odds be... with David, I'll tell you that much. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 they must know something because they changed their names. They're not oil companies anymore. They're energy companies. That's right. This was the first step yeah, but that's, in that's the rebranding. Greenwashing. That's greenwashing. Well, I know, but yeah. it, maybe it's maybe it's real. No, I mean, I, I don't think any of the petroleum companies are interested in in accelerating this transition to electric no. vehicles. Uh, I mean, they, you know, I think that, you know, at, at one point it was, you know, that these, these electric vehicles can't work. Nobody's going to want them. Nobody can use them. Um, I think now that the opponents of electric vehicles are more in the mode of yes, 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 we'll make this transition, but let's just do it as slowly as possible. Uh-huh. You know, we have, we have 30 years of oil that we'd like to um, pull out. And now it's even more burn. than that. <laughs> and yeah. or whatever and, and like if, you, and, if, and if then, fracking, then if fracking that, goes yeah. goes unchecked it's more than that right yeah, exactly. yeah but sure. then after after we do that then yeah then we can and we'll do it switch. yeah and we'll all yeah. be dead but guess what i, I don't know who we're gonna sell no. to, you know but uh, we'll yeah. just we'll just be living in a hotter less hospitable yeah. world that um and wait and, wait david so so let me ask, let, let, let me come at this another way uh i just try to stay open here to yeah. not so open that my brains spill out, but I want to just make sure all options are covered. Uh, you go back 120 years, there were horses everywhere. Uh, I see the old pictures in New York City. The horses everywhere, horse-drawn ca- carriages and cabs and everything. And there's horse poop everywhere, manure. And so the city stank and there were flies and, they, and there were no supermarkets then. A lot of food merchants were just on the street. So the flies were in the food. And, and when I grew up, you didn't complain if flies were everywhere because that's just how everything was. Even in the deli, the flies all are. All right. You didn't want the flies, but you lived with them. You get rid of the manure, okay, then you get rid of most of the flies. So how are you going to get rid of the manure? Well, you can put something in the horse's feed so maybe the flies don't like it. You put less bulk in there so they poop less. There are all these solutions, 
And the solution really was the car. Okay. But no one was saying, let's, let's invent a car so that we don't have flies on my deli sandwich. It was, there was just progress. So I recently saw a, 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 a news brief on this startup company that wants to pull CO2 out of the atmosphere. They, they, they have this, this array, this like phased array of the raw ingredients that has everything except CO2 to make limestone. And they blow the air across it that this substance, this powdery substance grabs the CO2 and makes limestone. And then they take the limestone and bury it into the earth. These would be CO2 scrubbers, I think we call them. And if one of these was at every power plant, then we could control, in, in, a, in an act of geoengineering, control the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere. And if we did that, and if we could do it, then you could burn as much oil as you wanted until there's not a drop left. And, and it will have no effect on climate change, provided we this doesn't run away from us. So is there any thinking along those lines? Well, I think what's a lot cheaper and easier is not putting the CO2 in the atmosphere than <laughs> trying, to, trying to pull it out. The, the, the best thing you can do is just avoid it altogether. If you can walk, bike, take transit, um, take your electric bike, skull, whatever, that's the best thing you can do. The, the second best thing is, is, to, is to, not, to not burn the gasoline. Um, so really, the, the, the solution to the uh, um, anecdote that you gave, Neil, is get rid of the horses. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's, a, the, the that's the 21st real, century version, the version real, of that. Just get rid of it. So, yeah. But yeah, it makes sense. Yeah. I mean, and, and the well, wait, but David, 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 I, I live in the, in the real world here, and I yeah. interact with the public daily through my social media platforms, and... I care about how they think because I knowing that enables me to communicate more effectively. All right. So that my message is received with receptors that I know lives within them. And what I can tell you without hesitation is there's always some fraction of the population that's ready to change and modify their behavior and do whatever they got to do Early for the good of the earth. And then there's the rest of everybody that says, I don't want to change a damn thing. I fear change. And <laughs> so, for example, go back 150 years. We were still slaughtering uh, whales for whale, whale oil. For whale oil. All right, to burn our lamps and everything. And the blubber was highly valuable. And there were people who didn't want to kill these majestic creatures. Were they successful? Not really. Yes, we stopped killing whales, but not really because they're saying no. We stopped killing whales because we found Let's oil just... in the ground. Okay? <laughs> yeah. We found oil in the ground to burn. So so once again, things changed because not because you got billions of people to change their behavior, but because some form of discovery technology, um, some some addition to our civilization did not require you to change your behavior. You are right in that this, you know, we it's an, an amazing amount of change in a really short period of time. Look, if, if you look 15 years ago, the only people that had electric cars were people that basically had to make their own electric cars. Like, no, they, they were people car. who played golf. People who played golf. Yeah, okay. Golf, yeah. golf carts. <laughs> but, uh, no, there was, a, there was a few people out there making their own, like, <laughs> electric cars in okay. their garage. Yeah, and then um, and if you look at maybe like ten years ago, you really had to go out of your way to get an electric car. There was only a few available. Um, they some of them weren't really great at being a car, uh, and you had to go out of your way to do it. And there weren't there weren't a whole lot of them sold. If you right. look at today, we got in California a tw over twenty five percent of yes. new cars are right. plug in electric, electric vehicles. And all so electric, yeah, yeah it, uh, and we so we are getting. We are getting past the early adopters. We're starting to get into, um, you know, really into the mainstream, at least in parts of the U.S. Yeah. Um, and okay, that wait, David, is, just just so you know, don't be so yeah. surprised because back to the horses. New York City went from all horses in 1905 <laughs> to basically all cars in 1920. You couldn't give away a horse 15 years later, yeah. and we <laughs> civilization was built 
literally and figuratively on the backs of horses for thousands of years, and they were gone within 15 years. And that's got to be a yeah. bigger transition. To, for that, that was surely a bigger transition for anybody around at the turn of that century than going from combustion engine to electric cars today. It's for the same reason, though. Cars are so much better than horses. That's all there was to it. They're just so much better. And I think the same thing will happen with electric vehicles. Electric vehicles are just so much better than combustion engines, except for the one concern that most people have, and that is range anxiety. But for the average driving needs of that's most That's a solvable people, problem. That's very solvable. Right? And it's, it's just yeah. so much better. David, are you... Are you concerned, do I get to use that word in this way? Are you concerned <laughs> about people's range anxiety, about whether they're gonna run out of battery and there's no place to refill and then they're stranded on the road? You, they, yeah. can't even, they can't even walk to the nearest station with gas a can. Gas station and get a and, can and, of gas. And, get, and bring the can of gas back. Excuse well, me, do I, you have a 25 mile long cord? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, there that the issue of like where do you charge for most of the people buying an electric car today? It's pretty simple. You charge in your driveway or your garage, um, and you you know. Okay, then, so instead of filling up in, in the road, you fill up at home. Yeah, yeah, and so that that's part of the thing is that you don't. You know, if you're driving, a lot of the cars right now have over 200 mile range. So yeah. you're, for most of your driving, everyday driving, you're commuting to work or, you know, visiting. For me, visiting family in, in the Bay Area, like, it's it's not a really a question of where do you charge. I charge in the garage, and then you know, if 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 it's low on range, I plug it in, and the next morning, it's full. You're good to go. Uh, it, it's really simple. Um, now we do need those public charging stations so that you can take those longer trips easily, or if you don't have the the, the ability to charge at home, um, and so that's something that is is happening right now is building out that 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 charging infrastructure so that more people can use it. So I'm going to add to this. When I was growing up, uh, in we saw a lot of plays. I grew up in New York City. The Playbill always had multiple ads for cars and they always showed people driving on an open road and it's like take a trip today go uh, take a drive and and uh, it's sunday take a drive and i and i just thought that was the natural order of the universe that when you got a car you just f found a place to drive to the car wasn't a utility it was an expression of your freedom and i don't see that happening anymore I don't people say, oh, let's take a drive for 100 miles and look at the scenery and then come back. I don't see or maybe it's still happening. I yeah. don't see it. Yeah. It could be that this range anxiety is a leftover from people who were thinking about taking a 200 mile car trip, but today just wouldn't do that anymore. You, right. you get on Zoom and talk to people. You yeah. know, what are you doing that for? What's the need? Yeah. So what are you doing maybe that for? You've got to be in the car with your family. Come on. Oh, is that it? Okay. <laughs> so, so, David, I, maybe there's fewer trips that are even necessary. I mean, look, you, people buy an electric car, they want to be able to see, like, hey, can I get from Oakland to, to Boston? You know, can I drive there? It's like, you know, are there enough charging space? Not that they ever road? did before. No. But okay, go on. And, or not yeah. that I ever will, right? If I need to get to <laughs> right. Boston, I'm probably going to go to the airport. Um, and, and, uh, and I don't want to have to drive for, for days on end to do that. But, you know, I think that people want to be able to see that. And it's something that, you know, this is a transition that, that is, you know, we are still on the first steps of this transition exactly. and, and we are, there are, there's federal funding for in the bipartisan infrastructure law over 7 billion to build out charging stations um, in the U.S., um, a lot of the car companies are investing in charging uh, infrastructure right. to make sure that you can make all of those trips. Um, now, it's going to be a little bit different than a gasoline car. You might have to do a little bit of like planning or 
or at least see like where the charging stations are. Well, they have right apps now. for that now. They're, I mean, I, right. have an, it's an I have an electric car. It's an app. It tells me when I get in yeah. the car, the first thing it says is where I can go charge if I need why it. Don't the tr- why don't the traditional convenient marts all have electric charging stations or do they? I haven't noticed that. The charging yeah, stations I, tend to be in other places. I mean, it's 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 a... F- there are different there's different reasons why different charging stations are in different places and it depends on who's buying the charging station whether it's a car company or a, th- a, a for-profit uh, you know third-party charging company but i think part of it is just that like it is going to take a just a different slightly different mindset and we are people that have where the norm is the gasoline car and the, the electric vehicle is the weird thing. And I have to do research. I have to figure it out. Okay. Like yeah. if you go, you know, like if we go to, if we went to a car dealership and said like, I'd like to buy a gasoline car, they wouldn't spend time telling me, well, here's how you refuel it. Like, you know, here's, <laughs> That's how right. Right? But, but, here's the map but, like, of I'm, gas stations for right. you. Yes. <laughs> but, but I'm, you know, if I was, if I was maybe not an expert on EVs and going to, it, I might have those questions. Right. So it's a different mindset. Like my daughter is 18. She learned how to drive on an electric car. That is the normal for her. I, when she was going, she went off to college this, uh, this fall and there are rental cars on her campus. And I was like, oh my gosh, do you know how to refuel a gasoline car? <laughs> she said, no, no. I, I had to, we had to go to a gas station and, and like, okay, here's, you know, you, you take the, you take right. the nozzle out, you put here, you, here's how you do it. And, and, you know, that is just, you know. Plus, you don't want her to be one of those people who likes the smell of gasoline. You know, there's some <laughs> people. Who are those people? I don't know who those people are, but they exist for sure. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I know for, I mean, also for an 18 year old, like, uh, instead of spending $70 at a gas station, charging at home every day, <laughs> every night is, is, <laughs> is a great, is a great deal. Bit, bit different. Well, plus, often the, the, the electric rates are lower at night. So it's very natural. Yes, uh, to Absolutely. plug in your Kill car overnight. Hours are much cheaper at night, which is why you got to yes, plug yeah. in, plug in at night, charge overnight, guys. <laughs> yeah. yeah. In any event, it's going to be cheaper than, than gasoline. What is the compatibility among different uh, charging stations with the cars people buy? Because with all the gas nozzles, they match up no matter what brand of car it is. So did we have this issue coming into this brand new marketplace? Yeah. So most, most of the charges at home were, were the same type. Uh, when we look at chargers, though, for the fast charging, we had essentially three different plugs. Um, one plug that the Japanese car companies were using, one that the U.S. and the uh, European car companies were using, and then one that Tesla was using. Um, now, p- pretty much all cars and all manufacturers from 2025 and onwards have said they're going to use the North American charging standard as the one plug. So. Right now, there's still this diversity of plugs, but going forward, that's all going to standardize to one fast charging plug. Okay, yeah, that's, 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 that's very hopeful. I know we're still in the early days of this marketplace, but right now, if you compare the price of an electric car to that of an internal combustion, there's a very big gap there. So is, are electric cars a rich people's game, and will that ever change? I mean, as we're as we're getting more and more models out there, we're going to see both you know luxury cars, and we're going to see more recently priced uh, electric vehicles. One thing that is going to help is that the uh, federal um, tax credit um, has is is going to make that initial cost of the the electric vehicle more competitive with a gasoline vehicle. Um, starting in in January of 2024, um, a lot of car companies are going to be able to offer that at the dealership. So yeah. you don't have to wait for your tax return. You're just going to get that um, just as, as as part of that, you know, taken off the sale price. So this the is the vehicle. federal government basically investing in, in the stability of its own energy future. So you foresee a in, in the near future, not only marketing incentives brought by, by federal government, but also the a, an overall drop in price. Do you foresee that? Yeah, we're, we're seeing battery prices come down and i mean they've they've dropped dramatic dramatically in the last decade um and i think that's still going to happen as we start building more back to batteries um have that price of the batteries come down which makes the price of electric vehicle come down the other part of it is that the upfront cost of these electric vehicles is higher but the cost of recharging these vehicles is much lower than buying gasoline so on net um you're going to be able to have a total cost of ownership that's less 
Um, but it is and less maintenance and repair, incentive. of course. Yeah, L- you're less gonna, maintenance you're, and repair. Yeah, no oil changes for the fully electric vehicles. No spark plugs. Um, it's you know it's a pretty simple um, electric motor. Um, so there's not really much maintenance. You know, you still have to change the tires, um, but. <laughs> You got to put the windshield wiper fluid in, but that's about it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. okay. Uh, is there still talk of possibly swapping out a battery so that you don't have to wait the duration of time? Because not all charging stations are 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 created equal, right? Depends on the voltage. And as I understand it, David, the charging rate goes as the square of the voltage, right? And so. Uh, if I understand that correctly. So you want as high a voltage charging station as possible, and then it goes rapidly, yeah. uh, maybe in the time it takes you to have a cup of coffee. It's great. But to the extent that those are not available, Which you can't not. on a trip say, I got to sit here for two hours and charge while I twiddle my thumbs. Uh, I, I, I would have finished my cup of coffee in 15 minutes. So what <laughs> is it? Do you guys have a response to that on the grid? Yeah. Yeah, so on the latest charging stations go up to, to 350, 350. Ki- 350 kilowatts, um, and the 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 there's also a part of it that's dependent on the car. So some of the cars are built around an 800 volt architecture that can accept um, the maximum rate of charge, and so those cars are cars that you can go from say 20 percent charge to 80 percent charge in in less than 20 minutes. Um, and so that that's is really all you need, right? That, that's yeah, all you that's, need. That, yeah. yeah. And that is the case where like, Hey, like if you've been driving for, for two or three hours, yeah. Like it's not bad to take a, a 15 minute or 20 minute stop, stretch your legs, get a cup of coffee, et cetera. And so I think, I think that is part of it is that, you know, as we look into the future, more and more of the cars are going to be capable of doing those faster charges where it's, yeah, it's going to be a little bit longer than, a, than, um, than filling up with gasoline. I don't know when I, t- when I take road trips with, with, with my kids, uh, you know, the, 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 the gasoline stop is not the one that, that extends my, <laughs> my trip. It's the, it's the having to stop for the bathroom, having to stop for snacks, right. Right. then stopping for the bathroom again. And <laughs> so that, th- those are the stops. Yeah. Uh, and if we're talking yeah. about going 400 miles or something, then, you know, you're probably going to make a stop anyway. Yeah, maybe too. And like you said, the fast chargers are amazing. They they charge you like like you said from first of all, you're never going to zero because the the car won't let you. It, the app tells you, "Hey man, you got to go here and charge." And secondly, so you're down around 20%, you're going up to 80%, you know, and sometimes even uh, and it takes about 20, not even 20 minutes. The last time I did it on a 350 kilowatt charger, uh it, it took me nine, 18 minutes exactly. And I went hmm. to 92%, I remember. And the only reason I stopped is because some guy pulled up to the charging station and he was looking at me like, you dick. I can't believe you're at the 350 <laughs> charging station. So I can see he wanted that charging station because there was only one 350 kilowatt uh, okay, charging Okay, this is the future of street fights. Exactly. Is access so, to the high. So I saw him about to park and I wait. I motioned to him. I was like, yo, man, I'm going to leave. And I just stopped. So, you know, I mean, but at some point, you won't have that. At some point, I, I envision a time, and maybe it's me just being super optimistic, but I envision a time where municipalities will invest in charging stations. So instead of parking meters, you'll plug in, you'll pay your parking meter and a charging fee, and the and the city will make money that way. You know, I could totally see that happening. Stop trying to give advice for how New York City can get more parking <laughs> fees. I know that's me. true. What's stop, wrong with me? Stop that. <laughs> stop. Okay. Um Dave, we got to sort of land this plane here. Oh, I got wait, this show is over? Questions wait, it can't I know. Be. No way. I know. This okay, is so, so good. David, David uh, can the grid handle 100% electric cars? The electrical grid? The power yes, grid? It, yeah, it, it will be able to if we do this right. And that's the sort of the, the next that doesn't sound we very encouraging we will oh. maybe if we sort of might be able to because well, we th- could- that's because because be careful what we wish for you want everybody to have electric cars you have electric cars now we have to have brownouts or blackouts because the electric car is definitely drawing more power than my air conditioner did in the summer right 
when they're telling me to, 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 to unplug stuff because the power grid can't handle it. What assurance do I have that on the other side of that equation, on the other side of the plug, the power is going to be there for everybody if everybody switches over? Mm. I mean, that's a great example because your air conditioner, I mean, you need it when you need it, right? Like you you need it at maybe at, at 4 p.m. On, on a summer day yeah. um, and, and you don't you're not really interested in changing that to, to using it at 4 a.m. maybe. Right. Uh, and so that is the thing is that most EVs are going to be parked for over 20 hours a day, maybe 23 hours a day. Um, and they're probably going to actually act even at home actively charge for maybe two or three hours, even if you've been driving around. Right. And so, okay, so it spreads, it spreads that out. Okay. If we can be smart about when those cars are being charged, like you only, if you only need to charge for two hours, um, you know, it doesn't need to be at the same time than your your air conditioner. Or okay, so so I'm making this up, but the power company could then strategically price hour by hour what your fees are, forcing people to respond to save money by charging their cars at different times of day. Yeah, I just got an email today from from Marin Clean Electricity that that had an offer that if you said, okay, I need, if you have use their app and say, okay, I need to have my car fully charged by 7 a.m., but you get, but you, the power company get to pick when they would give you a rebate because that way they could money back. They could pick. And the great thing is that that lets you actually get more renewables on the grid because, Hey, look, if there's more wind power or if it's during the day, like, you know, it's, it's, it's 10 a.m. in the morning and, Air conditioners haven't kicked on yet, but we have lots of solar power. Charge the vehicles then, oh, so you can yeah, sync up yeah. renewables and with the and with the source power. of power that it is without having to store it. You can just right. distribute it through the twenty four hour cycle. That's right. brilliant. Yeah, it's like obvious but completely brilliant. I was going to say at some point the grid will be smart enough, won't it, to to actually. <clears throat> uh, kind of almost as a collaboration with the homeowner to tell you, hey, you know, or, or to look at patterns and find for you the best time to do everything. Yeah, and I think that's where we need to go. It's But it's going to require that the car companies, it's going to require the utilities, the regulators all sort of working together. I mean, right now it's not an issue, but we want to lay the foundation so that when we do get all those electric vehicles out there, that this is all worked out and we're not trying to figure it out on the back end. Right. So have we uh, solved this other than just batteries? Is there a more inventive storage mechanism for daytime solar power or, or does it have to be used as it gets generated? I mean, I think the easiest thing is that if we can use it when it's available, that is the best thing. And that's mm-hmm. where EVs, both in passenger vehicles, also larger vehicles, uh, trucks, school buses are a great example because they only get used usually like twice a day and the rest yeah. of the time they could be sitting there being charged. The other thing that we can do is that if everyone has a big battery in their driveway or, or garage is that we could even go one step further. Instead of just controlling when they charge, we could have them send power back, back to the grid, grid when there is the peak load. Right. Um, so that is the other step uh is sort of not just controlling when they charge but can they actually feed power back or if there's a power outage can they power a home or even help power a neighborhood um this all falls under vehicle to grid integration and it is Mm, okay incredibly important thing that is is that's awesome where we're just starting to sort of figure out the policies to make that happen and real quick is there any any plans to have like photovoltaic skins on a car so that the car itself becomes a recharging source in the daytime (laughs) car stranded at night okay (laughs) but okay yeah yeah there are people that have looked into that there there's a few models that have, have have looked into doing that but in general it's hard to get enough uh you don't have enough area to really recharge oh, the you. car. You, you need more area. And also the other thing is you have to be parked somewhere that is um, sunny where you can use that. <laughs> and, and, and it might not necessarily be at the right angle. Whereas if you have panels on the ground or on a roof, 
you you can angle them correctly and they're going to get sun uh, when it's sunny um so i think that is the problem yeah you can make a solar powered car it's been done they i think they had a race in australia uh, like decades ago uh, where they did that. Um, but it involved having like one person laying down in this very flat aerodynamic car. Uh, um, okay. And so maybe not um, practical for, for, for you. Not ready for kids. prime time yet. <laughs> yes. Okay. <laughs> Guys, we got to close this out. David, how do we find you, the Union of Concerned Scientists online? Where, what's your, the website there? Yeah, we are at www.ucsusa.org. UCSUSA. And does it include? Do you collaborate with uh, other other countries? Yeah, most of our work is is based in the U.S., but we definitely you know have have some work uh, in terms of like the international climate right. work. David, this has been uh, delightfully informative, and I'm glad to know that you and others of your brethren exist in this world being of course concerned about it. and you didn't sound too pissed off you're still in the realm of concern the day you get pissed off call us back we'll give you platform for that uh, all right we can and we can talk some more uh, and you probably have other scientists we might try to uh, uh, plumb the depth of expertise among your ranks there that'll be fun to bring people on to talk about other issues that concern the Union of Concerned Scientists. So Dr. Reichmuth, thanks for being on Star Talk. Thanks for having me. It was a pleasure. So all right, Chuck, good to have you, man. Always a pleasure. All right. This has been Star Talk, uh, a Union of Concerned Scientists edition, telling us about the future of an electrified world. Neil deGrasse Tyson, as always, bidding you to keep looking up. <laughs>